Shem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach, Shil Torah, Baruch Hashem, very good to uh, be here. This is uh, going to be our uh, last Shiur, Bezat Hashem, uh, in uh, Aventura for some time. Uh, next week, Bezat Hashem, I'm going to be in New York uh, doing some lectures over there. Um, uh, we have, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, four lectures already set up and maybe a few others during the afternoon. We'll try to... Uh, put things live, uh, or at least online right away, so you guys don't miss out, and uh, anyone that wants to uh, sponsor the lectures or anything like that, I made some posts uh, online for anyone that wants to uh, get involved and uh, be a sponsor, because obviously we do everything for free, but it's not free. Um, as far as uh, tonight, tonight is a uh, special Mishnah, because just like the Mishnah we talked about, uh, I guess what it's like a couple of months ago, a few months ago, two, three months ago, about Genom, where there is no way that you could escape it, because uh, that's pretty much what the Mishnah talks about. In essence, this Mishnah and actually the next couple of Mishnayot also talk about some scary things. It's not going to be a sure about Genom, but uh, it is going to be a little scary, uh, a scary reality. It is going to be a scary reality. It's not going to be the gruesome details of what we talked about in regards to gay norm or anything like that, but anyone that understands what I'm about to say uh, and what the Mishnah says uh, should be scared. If not, it just means that you're, you're spiritually dead. That's, that's all. All it means that you're dead. You know, if, if, let's say, for example, you, know, you pinch your friend and he doesn't feel it, you, know, you take a little pin and you stick him with it. If he still doesn't feel it, it just most likely means he's dead. That's, that's all it means. Uh, if he doesn't feel it at that point, it means he's, he's, his body is, has, has left the world. Um, but unfortunately, most people are not going to be scared of this one. Most people are not going to be scared of this one at all. Um, and the reason is, is because we are unfortunately, uh, spiritually distant from reality. And unless Hashem makes it real, for many of us, myself included, it's very hard for us to feel. It's very hard for us to feel what the Torah says. Uh, aside from that, after uh, we'll talk about the schedule after at the end of the shiur. But uh, aside from that, this is the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot number 100. Number 100, uh, Baruch Hashem, this uh, series has been going on already for uh, a year and a half or so, maybe two years almost. And we still have a lot to go because these next uh, chapter and a half that we have uh, is very, very dense. Each one of the Mishnayot, as you've noticed, is a few shurim. The first, uh, the first four chapters we had, usually it was one Mishnah per, per shiur. Uh, these, this, this Mishnah, which chapter 5 that we're in, and chapter 6 is even more dense than chapter 5, uh, it's uh, so deep, and so many details in each one, that uh, I believe that every single one of them is going to be at least two shiurs, and in some cases three, four, five shiurs. All depends on how deep we want to get into it, and since we're not in a race uh, to finish, we're in a race to do tshuva, instead, uh, you know, we're not trying to hurry up, we're trying to actually get... Uh, you know, get to the bottom line. Get to the bottom line. So, uh, also, Shio today will be for a refuah uh, shlema to Levana bat Sarah. Sarah bat Levana, Ovadia ben Levana, David ben Nesriya, Doris bat Jora, um, Judith Schnog, uh, Lindsay Meesters, Gilbert Isaiah Batista, um, Dvora uh, bat Mercedes, Elisheva, Chaya bat Sarah, Chava bat Chana, Bauch ben Rivka, Rav Efraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Nechama, Edol, Bat Saramalka, 
and all of Am Yisrael, Be'ezrat Hashem, will have a refuah shlema, refuah ha-nefesh, refuah ha-guf. The Mishnah in Avot, you know, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm learning this Mishnah, it's a, uh, it's, it's amazing. I can't say any other word other than to say it's amazing how Hashem does what He does. How Hashem is Hashem. Everything is so precise. And that don't just necessarily mean, oh, the apple always tastes like an apple. Or the, uh, you know, the uh, nature does what it does. I mean, things that if you actually pay attention to them, you'll see then how the measure for measure system that Hashem operates on is so precise to every single detail that it's both scary and amazing at the same time. But we have no idea just how amazing and how scary it really is. So this Mishnah in Avot is going to help us a little bit. A couple of the students of Rabbi Yisrael Misalant who were mamash malachim. They made a deal. They always heard their whole life from their Rebbe, Or Israel. The Omek din, the, the depth of the din, the depth of the judgment, the measure for measure, system that Hashem runs the world on, is beyond human comprehension. The things that you would never think matter, matter. The smallest things, to such an extent that when the Rabbanit uh, of uh, the Ravadya um, Alava Shalom, his wife, when uh, she passed away, he cried hysterically. He cried hysterically for three days. And everyone knew, obviously, it's his wife for many, many years. She was a uh, Kodesh Kodeshim, his partner and everything. He said all the Torah is hers. No, just, but still, I mean, it's not, it wasn't necessarily a, uh, such a huge surprise. And it wasn't as if uh, anyone was worried that she wasn't in a better place. To be the wife that was there th from the beginning of the journey, before anyone knew there was going to be a journey, all the way until the end of living the life of the Gdola Dol, the Rabbani of the Gdola Dol, I mean, what are you worried about? What are you crying about? So even the sons asked, Rabbi Vadya, Abba, you haven't stopped crying. It's three days. What happened? Why? why? I mean, it's upset that we saw you love her, upset that, but... It's a little bit too much. He continued crying. And asked him again, Abba, no, tell us, no, why, why, what happened? He says, you have no idea what Omek Adin is. You have no idea the depth of judgment and how she's judged right now. What do you mean? She's the wife of the Gdola Dol. She's the one that was under the table, you know, feeding the kids and hiding when the Rabbi Vadya, when they, their whole house was just one room. One room, the whole house. No bathroom, no bedroom, no kitchen, just the whole house is four walls. He had to have a meeting with somebody to learn Torah with him, came to the house and started learning Torah. The, the actual, the guy that learned with him said the story himself. He said, that's how uh, he came to visit. He told me I had a question. I knew he was a Talmud Chacham. Before he became Rabbi Vadya the famous and everything. I knew it was Tami Chacham. I wanted to ask him a question. I came. We started learning together. And after a little while, maybe an hour into it, I started hearing a baby crying. I looked. There's nothing. There's only walls. Little do I know that the wife and children are under the table while we're studying Torah, not making a beep. So a wife like this, what are you worried about? Omek Adin. If you're worried about Omek Adin, the depth of judgment for all, why, what about us? That's exactly what it's saying. That's exactly the point, Rabotai. 
That's exactly the point. We have no idea what Omek Adin really is. The smallest, tiniest things that we think are nothing can make a world of difference, both on the good and the bad side. Hashem Rachem. The Talmidim of Or Israel, the Rabbi Israel Misalant, made a deal with each other after years and years of learning Musar, working on their Midot, and literally becoming angels walking on earth. They said to each other, whoever dies first, come back to the uh, one that's still alive as soon as possible to at least let the other one know how they're judging over there. Like if we still have time, we still have, listen, if it's, uh, if we're doing something wrong, at least give me a chance. Whoever survives, gives the one that uh, survives a chance to do tshuva. What tshuva? What tshuva? The angels, these people. But they understood. So after some time, one of them dies. But he doesn't come back to him in a dream. Not for a month, not for two months, not for three months. Almost a year passes. Eleven months exactly pass. And he comes to him in a dream. Immediately he said, no, why, why do you think you're so long? He goes, I couldn't come. Why? Why couldn't you come? He goes, I've been in, I've been in trial. Trial is a person that's Kodesh Kodeshim, Sefer Torah. He says, I've been on trial. I couldn't leave the trial. So, no, so tell me what happened. Tell me the bottom line. He says, I'm not allowed to say much to you. I'm not allowed to say much to you. You're doing good. But, it's one thing I am allowed to tell you. What? We have no idea what Omekadin is. We have no idea how deep the judgment really is. What the measure for measure is and how in Shemaim they literally look at even a basic conversation between you and your wife of how many words you use to tell her to go buy something from the store even. Store, this, and you know, we have to for Shabbat, buy this, buy this, buy this. We sometimes have a half hour conversation for something that takes five words. He says, even that they look at in Shemaim. This is Gemara Beforesh though. This is Gemara. So the Omek Adin, the depth of judgment, Rabotai, is something that, you know, we hear about a lot. We hear measure for measure. We hear about it in the Parashat Shavua. We hear about it in different Shurim. We see it in different books. But the details, the details are hard. Are hard for, for anyone to get into because it really requires you to do Cheshbon Nefesh. Because the few things that we're going to talk about today, you're not even going to think are sins. The few things we're going to talk about today, most of us don't even think are sins. So the Mishnah in Avot, this is chapter 5, Mishnah 10. Now, technically this Mishnah is broken up into two. This, this uh, way that they broke up this, uh, this Sedel, they broke up this specific Mishnah into two Mishnayot. So it says, seven types of punishment come to the world. And this Mishnah has three, and the next Mishnah has four. So tonight, Bezad Hashem, will do three. Meaning the first Mishnah out of the two, and when we come back, Bezad Hashem will do the rest. So it says, Shiva Amin Apuraniyot, Ba'in la'olam al shiva gufe avera. Miktsatan me'asrin u miktsatan enan me'asrin. Rav shel batzoret ba. Miktsatan re'evim u miktsatan sve'im. Gamru shelo la'asir. Rav shel me'uma veshel batzoret ba. Veshelo litol et achala rav shel klaya ba. Seven types of punishment come to the world for seven kinds of transgressions. Really, Gufe Avera, Gufe Avera, that it uses in Hebrew, Rashi says the literal translation of it is not transgressions, but rather severe sins. Seven types of punishment come to the world for seven types of severe sins. So what are you thinking immediately? You think Chilu Shabbat, Chilu Hashem, all those big things. They're in here. They're in here. But the initial ones you're never going to think are in here. 
So these are the first three of those sins that bring disaster to the world. A, first one, if some people give ma'asel and some people don't. Famine is caused by lack of rain and r- lack of rain ensues. Some go hungry and some are satisfied. We see here the midah keneged midah, the measure for measure. Some people give ma'asel, the tithe, and some people don't. This causes famine to the extent where the rain is disproportionate. Some people have panasa and some people don't have panasa. It's a class warfare. You're either rich or poor. There's no middle class in so many words. We'll go into the details of what all of this means. B, second one. If all decided not to give masel, everyone decides. Not just some, everyone is saying that. It's not, you know, you don't have to do it anymore. Everyone decides not to tithe. General famine is caused by armed bands and drought ensues. Meaning the famine now hits everyone. Everyone is starving. Everyone is hungry. Everyone is in trouble. If it got worse now, we go to see. What's the third one? If not only they stopped giving my sale, but they also decided not to separate the challah. No challah, meaning somebody makes a challah. You make five kilograms of challah. You have to take a little piece as the mitzvah of challah. And the people decide, nah, you don't need to do it anymore. It's not relevant to us anymore. Or, as it says, a uh, psalm will actually make dafka, make a little bit less than the obligated amount, just so they don't have to fulfill the mitzvah of challah. Either they don't give, or the dafka makes slightly less than the amount that would obligate you to give the mitzvah of challah. So if they decide not to separate the challah, famine caused by fatal drought ensues. Meaning the type of drought that many, many Hashem Yachem Aleinu die. Not just starve, not just trouble, not just a few people are sick, a few kids are hungry at night. Death. Shem Aleichem. Now let me ask you guys a question before I continue. I mentioned Maasil. And I mentioned Mitzvah of Chala. Does anyone here, honestly, be intellectually honest, don't pretend like you're Shlomo Melech. Does anyone here even consider it a sin, Bechlal, not to give Maasil? Not to do the Mitzvah of Chala? Exactly. Based on Allah, based on Allah, these are mitzvot from the Torah. But we didn't think it's to such an extent that it's going to bring drought to the whole world. It's going to, Hashem, people are going to die. Okay, Hashem, take it easy. Why are you so uptight? You know what's going on here? Why is it such a big deal? And that's why Musar is so critical for each one of us to learn on a day to day basis especially the root of it because the only way we're going to have even a remote chance of understanding what measure for measure really means the the rabbi ponovich used to come to the chafetz chaim he was young, and Chafetz Chaim was already the, he was a Dole Dole, and he was much older than him. And he used to come to visit him all the time, especially when he would come back from trips to raise money for the yeshivot, tell the Rav how he succeeded, how he, if he didn't succeed, whatever happened. One time, the Rav Miponovich, Rav Kahaneman, comes to visit the, uh, the Chafetz Chaim after one of his trips, that he came back from South Africa. He tells him, you know, he uh, got this, he did this, do, 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 do. and he's surprised when the Chafetz Chaim tell, asks him a question you would never think would come out of his mouth. He says, how are the black people over there? How are they doing? He's looking around, he's like, am I talking to the right guy? 
What does he care about the black people in Africa? Not like he's asking about Am Israel. You know, how many yeshivot do they have? Uh, you know, uh, how, are they religious? They keep Shabbat. Well, what is he? He's asking about the black people who live in South Africa. What does the Rav care about the black people who live in South Africa? It's not what, what's it to you? So he was young. And he says himself, I honestly, I didn't know what to answer, so I said, for the Rav, why do you care about the black people in South Africa? And Chafetz Chaim tells him, no, I heard they're mistreated over there. And there's a lot of persecution against the black people in South Africa. If it's true, you should know this is a warning to Am Israel. Why? Every single time something happens anywhere in the world, whether it's an earthquake in India, or a tsunami in Haiti, or a, uh, some type of terrorist attack in America, or anything that happens in the entire world, it's a warning to Am Yisrael to do tshuva. What do you mean? But it's happening to them. It's not happening to us. No. It's a warning to us to show us this is what's going to happen to you if you don't do tshuva. Every single thing that happens in the world, Hashem is talking to Am Yisrael. If they're persecuting them, that means there's something wrong. Why? Not only they're mistreating the, the creation of Hashem, but also that means there's not enough Kedushah in the world. There's not enough Kedushah over there. There's not enough Torah over there for such things to happen. So Rabotei Yekarim, the details that the sages thought about in regards to what's happening around the world is much more intense than we could ever imagine. They didn't ask about what's happening in the news because they cared about who won the election, uh, where the economy is going, and who is the new billionaire in the Forbes 500. No. For them, they knew that everything connected to the bottom line. What's the bottom line? Am Yisrael. And all of us that are sleeping while we're awake, thinking that, oh, as long as I do tshuva, as long as I keep Shabbat, as long as uh, my wife is nice to me, my husband's nice to me, the kids go to school, everything's okay. Oh, Hashem, everything's okay. No, my friends. Kol Yisrael Aravim Zela Zela means everyone in Israel is responsible for each other, but that also means responsible for each other in a sense that you let each other know what's happening everywhere. Hey, over here in France, we have some serious problems. The Muslims have taken over. They've pretty much become the majority. Let Am Yisrael know, Am Yisrael know there's not enough Torah in the world. What do you mean? But it's you and friends. Leave friends. Go to England. Go to Israel. Go to America. Go to Australia. Go somewhere else. No, 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 no. You don't understand. It has nothing to do with France. It has nothing to do with England or with Europe or with America or with anything. The fact that there is Jews suffering anywhere in the world, that means... Jews somewhere else are not doing good. Jews somewhere else are not doing good. It's not just them. It's also Jews somewhere else. So now that we understand that the world is not hefkel. It's not just live, live your life, do your thing. Enjoy yourself and look forward for Olam Abba. We realize the details are a little bit scarier than that. A little scarier than that. So we call this in Judaism measure for measure. Midah ke neged midah. And the way it works is that Hashem carefully analyzes each and every single act, each and every single thing that we do, And he matches it with a punishment or a reward. Every single thing. Every single act receives either a reward or a punishment. And the reality is that anyone that's spiritually sensitive, pays attention to the details around them, can actually know for sure like would not a oh maybe he looks like it oh he looked like this he went no no like gosh would like with no doubt in his mind 
of where he needs to do tshuva. Why? He looks at his life. He looks at the world around him. He looks at his own world, his own sphere, and he sees all the black spots. Okay, yeah, over here I'm not getting enough money. Okay, that means I got to do this. Okay, over here I still don't have a zivug. Okay, that means something. Okay, over here I'm this. He sees all the things that are missing in his life. If he's spiritually sensitive, meaning he's paying attention to what he's doing versus what he's supposed to be doing, he could literally know what's expected from him in Shemaim. Now, the problem for most of us is that we don't view punishment as punishment. We view it as nature. Most of the punishment that comes down to the world looks like nature. It looks like it's something that's a uh, happenstance. It just happened to be that way. It happened to be that in our neighborhood, the Irma showed up. The uh, hurricane. It happened to be that the economy dropped 30% in our local community. It happened to be that there was a missionary that came to the community. It happened to be that the richest guy in, the, in town that used to be a big gvir and give to all of the uh, you know, uh, all of the places, all of a sudden declare bankruptcy. Everyone says, yeah, it happened to him and Hashem will give another way. But the reality is, Rabotai, the Me'ini says, every single thing in your life, everything, is supposed to arouse you to do cheshbon nefesh. To do a self-scrutiny in order to do tshuva. Everything. Now this can confuse us a little bit, what I just said. Why? Because Hashem told Avraham Avinu, don't look for signs. Am Israel is not dependent on any type of mazal or signs. And the reality is that people always look for signs. Just today on the way here, I got an email. Someone asked me, listen, I have this thing. It's a recurring theme. I keep seeing the number 15. 15 here, 15 there, 15, 15, 15. A month ago, somebody else told me, yeah, my daughter sees the number 3. Number 3 here and the number 3 there, 3, 3, 3 everywhere. Another one told me, uh, I see, I saw a bird. And it, uh, you know, I never see this bird. And everyone looks for all these unusual, you know, they see things and they, they believe, you know, this has to mean something. Now, technically, everything means something, but this is not what we mean by signs that are permissible. What they're doing as far as the threes and the fifteens and the birds and the cats and all of that stuff, that's forbidden. You're not allowed to look for signs like that. Oh, the sky looked this way, the sky looked that way. Those are signs, that's magic tricks. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about things that are obvious. Meaning, things that are not, oh, maybe it means something or maybe it doesn't. No. What the sages are trying to explain to us is that there are things that are definitive, meaning they happened. A stock market crash happened. A real estate crash happened. A cryptocurrency uh, uh, you know, crash happened. All of these things happened. Whatever that happened. Someone died, happened. Whatever event happened. That, you have to see what it means. It's not up to debate whether it happened or it didn't. The crash happened. The, uh, the, the loss happened. The death happened. The sickness happened. The divorce happened. The, the kids off the death happened. The, you know, whatever disaster, whatever, anything. It happened. It's a verifiable happen. Now you have to find out what it means. How does it relate to you? Not, listen, the bird flew north instead of south. What does it say in the talk? No, no, this is, this, is my, this is things that you're looking for magic tricks. Magic tricks, Las Vegas, not here. We are looking for things that are obvious. You're not making enough money, something's happening. Your wife all of a sudden doesn't want to pay attention to you. Something's happening. Even worse, your wife tells you, uh, go fly a kite. I don't want to talk to you. For how long? The rest of the week. Something happened. Oh, yeah, it's because I wasn't nice to her. No, no, no. That too, but that's not the reason. 
Now, the naysayers, the kufrim, the heretics, the reshaim, the Erev Rav, hate this type of shiur. Why? Because they believe in a care bear God. Not just care bear rabbis, they believe in a care bear God that's not the God of Israel. They believe that everything is good and nothing bad happens and anything that bad happens, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the Satan, it's some outside force, it's something else. Hashem only gives good. This, by the way, is kfirah. This is heresy. And this Mishnah that was put together by the holiest of holy, our sages, our Chachamin, all the way from the first Mishnah from Moshe Rabbeinu in Mount Sinai, all the way to here. These are Tanaim, these are Kodesh Kodeshim. These are not like a local rabbi that just got a smichat three weeks ago. These are people who are able to revive the dead. This is a Mishnah. This is precedes the Gemara. This is our oral Torah. So it's not an opinion. It's facts. And we'll provide you more information about it. But here they're telling us something that all of the Kufrim, the heretics, the Erev Rav, and all the Rishayim in the world hate to hear. Things happen for a reason. Especially punishment. If you see someone getting a divorce, it's not just because they didn't get along. If you see someone die, it's not just because the guy was driving drunk. If you see somebody lose all their money, it's not just because it's a bad investment. If you see there's a hurricane or some type of natural disaster, it's not just because nature did its thing. In fact, thinking any of that is 100% kfira in Hashem. It's heresy in Hashem. And this Mishnah will tell us the details. And the Gemara that will support it and other things that we'll talk about will show you exactly what the Torah says. Not just that things happen, because we don't need the Torah to tell us that things happen. We just look at the world, we see things happen. It'll tell you exactly why. Exactly why these things happen. So first it says, these things that we don't even think are really big sins, not only are they big sins, they're considered severe. Severe. We start off with something that most of us don't even think is a sin, which is to give ma'asel. Unfortunately, the vast majority of people do not give ma'asel, especially in Am Yisrael. This is very sad reality. If you look statistically, as a matter of fact, this is one thing that the goyim actually have on us. If you go to any religious, Christian, Catholic, or uh, Muslim, it's not even a second thought for them to, whether or not to give the money to holy causes, what they believe is holy, their tithe or whatever it is. It's not a consideration. Even this... Uh, Rabbi wrote an uh, article maybe four or five years ago that I read. He said he had a friend that was a uh, pastor. And uh, he was telling him, listen, we have a uh, problem in our synagogue. The rabbi was telling, the Orthodox rabbi was telling the pastor, you have a problem in the synagogue. He goes, what's the problem? He goes, I have financial issues. He goes, ah, it's no problem for you guys. You'll fix it by the end of the month. So he looked at his friend, he writes this, he looked at his friend, he says, you know something about my synagogue I don't know? He goes, well, don't you get the tithe, the maaser at the end of every month? That's how we do it in my church. In my church, we get the tithe at the end of every month. The whole community gives the tithe. He goes, with you too also, or you do more often? You do more every week. He goes, what do you mean the whole community? The rabbi writes this, he says, he asks the pastor, the Aved Abu Dazara, the idol worshiper. He asks him, what do you mean your whole community gives the tithe? He goes, oh, you know, maybe 1 or 2% don't give, but the rest of them give. Most of them are good. Most of them give. 99% of the key, like it say, of our congregation gives the Maser. And the rabbi wrote, I don't know if he told his pastor friend or not, because it would be a public chilul Hashem, but he wrote in the article, he goes, sadly, in our community, 
the numbers are the opposite. In our community, 2%. If 2% of the community give maaser, we're doing great. And 98% don't give. This, Rabotai, is a reality everywhere. This is not just in his community or in the different... It's everywhere. And in reality, in most cases, it's even worse numbers than that. Most people do not think that giving maaser is something that is uh, you have to do. Maybe you should do it only when you're a millionaire. Maybe you should do it when only you have extra money. Maybe you should do it if you're really a tzaddik. Maybe all these different reasons. And when times are tough, the first thing that we stop doing is we stop giving. There were several people that didn't really like being Jewish that were coming up from Europe, moving to America. This is a few generations ago. And the story goes that uh, on the way to, uh, to the United States, there was a little bit of a uh, wind turbulence in the ship. And when they got to the United States, the rabbi asked them, what, they don't have tefillin in your country that you came from? They don't have tzitzio, they don't have kippah, nothing. You guys came all the way to America with nothing? Because no, we had it. We had it. Oh, so why don't you bring it? What, you didn't, you didn't bring your luggage? You didn't bring clothes? Because no, we brought the clothes. So what happened? Because no, there was a lot of turbulence on the way here. And the captain of the ship said, throw out all your extras. Throw out all your extras to save our lives. So we thought it's pikuach nefesh. We thought it's pikuach nefesh, so we threw out our tefillin. We threw out our kippot. We threw out our tzitzit. We threw out our books. And the Rav said to them, No, my friends. You didn't throw it out because of the wind. You didn't throw it out because the captain said, and you didn't throw it out because of the turbulence. You threw it out because simply you were looking for an excuse not to be Jewish. You were looking for a reason the whole time. And as soon as the door opened, Ah, this works out for me. This works out for me. The whole time you were looking not to be Jewish. Why? Because the reality is, why didn't you throw something else? Why didn't you throw out your clothes? Why didn't you throw out your shoes? Why didn't you throw out the, uh, all the other things you have? Why didn't you throw out the gold bars? Why didn't you throw out everything else? Why? Because you thought that everything else will save you while the Torah is holding you back. But in reality, the only thing that saved you is what you threw out. And this is, unfortunately, in many cases, you ask people, how are they doing? And they always complain. Regardless of how much money they make. And the reason why is because if you come from a religious position, they immediately think you want money. And in many cases, religious people do want money for their congregations, for their yeshivot, for their books, for different causes. If they're not going to do it, who's going to do it? But immediately people complain, and the reason why, I'm like, nah, it's a tough year this year, I'm not making enough money, I only made a million dollars this year, I only made a hundred thousand this year, I only made thirty thousand this year, I only made whatever I made, everybody's only, it's always only whatever the amount follows. Only a billion, only a million, only ten thousand, only, it's always only. Doesn't matter what the amount is, it's like a, it's like a given. And... And the reality is, is that first thing that this only mentality does, as soon as he feels this, this, this pressure that he's only making a certain amount, the first thing he stops doing is he stops giving masel. He stops giving staka. He stops giving what's not his to begin with. Why? Because he thinks that if I'm going to give masel, then I'm going to have less than what I already have now. How is that going to help? Hashem doesn't want me to hurt myself. It says He gave us the Torah to live by it, not to kill myself. So He thinks that by not giving Maaser and by not giving Tzedakah, He's helping His financial condition. This only means He didn't learn Torah. Because the Torah says the exact opposite. In the Gemara Masechet Gitin, page 7, He says something that is extraordinary. It says, Im Adam, שמזונותיו מצומצמים, יעשה, יעשה מהם צדקה. If a person 
sees that the, his sustenance, his living, his money, is not enough. He doesn't have enough money. All of a sudden, his income dropped by 50%. All of a sudden, what he has in the bank is not enough to do what he needs to do. He sees that his financial situation is not good. The Gemara, the Gemara that we have already for a couple of thousand years, that's the source is Mount Sinai. It's not some opinion. The Gemara says, if he's in that situation where he sees, in reality, not like he feels, he sees, he has bills 5,000, he only has 2,500 in the bank. So you know, it's not like a, a, an opinion, a pressure, he's nervous, maybe he doesn't have enough money for retirement. No, no, he sees Bivadai 100%, I don't have enough money to pay the bills. What does the Gemara say? He sees he doesn't have it, go give staka. What? Wait, hold on a second. I already told you I don't have enough for the Rav. I already told you I don't have enough. I don't have enough of my money to pay the bills. The kids, who knows I'm going to eat last week. This last week we just made it. Next week, who knows? How, you want me to give staka now? That's what the Torah says. That's what the Torah says. How does this make any sense? This is the opposite of logic. And that's what we're going to explain. The Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Levi Tzchak Miberdichov writes a pirush on this specific Gemara that if a person understands it, everything changes. He says, this Mishnah in Masechet Gitin, where it says to give the cow when you don't have enough money, it makes absolutely no sense. It's against logic. I already don't have enough. You're telling me to go give more. I I have five thousand dollars in bills a month. My bank account shows twenty five hundred. Alvai, twenty five hundred. It says twenty five hundred. I'm short fifty percent. You're saying, oh, you're short. Good. Go give staka. It doesn't make rational sense. And Rabbi Yitzchak Miberdichov says. Bidiuk. That's it. That's the point. Because it doesn't make sense, that's what makes sense. When it comes to maaser, when it comes to giving, there's no logic that you use and you're not even allowed to use it. You're not allowed to use your logic when you're giving tzedaka or maaser. You're not allowed, you're not permitted, you have no permission, you have no right to do cheshbonot for Hashem. And the reason why the Rabbi Yitzhak Berdichov says he heard from his Rav that any time, this is also confirmed in the Gemara, in Masechet Abu Dazara, and a few other places, any time someone has any type of confidence, any type of bitachon in anything, Let's just say his money, his bank account, his uh, stock portfolio, his real estate portfolio, his uh, car portfolio, whatever he has, his stamp collection. Anytime he gives any bitachon, any confidence whatsoever to anything of this world and saying, oh, my 401k, that's, that's my bailout plan. My stock portfolio, that's my retirement plan. My real estate, that's going to pay the kid's wedding. My uh, this, that's going to pay for just in case something happens. My this account, that's going to pay for the groceries this week. Even that. Anytime he gives anything, any confidence whatsoever that's of this world, he's chas v'shalom giving that thing power. What power? Power that's different from Hashem. In essence, he's just turning into Abu Dazara. His bank account just turned into an idol. His stock portfolio just turned into an idol. It's as if he's saying, the bank account that I have, the stock portfolio that I made, the money that I have, all these things, it's a power of its own. Having any, any type of bitachon in them is like giving independent power away from Hashem. A power that's outside of Hashem. As if it's not coming from Hashem. 
as if your sustenance is not coming from Hashem. As if the stock portfolio doesn't exist or will continue to exist because of Hashem. And giving it any type of power is the equivalent of idolatry. This, unfortunately, is something we are all or were all guilty of at some point or still are. Because all we do is try to plan ahead. People save, people do, people this. Now there's no specific prohibition of saving money or even of nice having nice things. You can have a mansion, you can have a nice car, you can have a retirement plan, there's no problem. So long as it doesn't cause you to sin. Meaning, so long as it does not cause you to do things that are the opposite of what Hashem wants you to do. The problem is, unless you learn Musar every day, and other Torah as well, every single day where Hashem becomes number one in your life, all those things do is make you sin. That's it. They don't do anything good for you. Like meaning, all the material things, the house, the car, the, 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 the whatever, you bought a, a universe somewhere, whatever you bought. Unfortunately, we don't know how to use it. And all, we, all the results, the outcome of those things are, is sins. So you're allowed to have them, so long as they don't make you sin. The problem is, since we don't know how to use them, all they do is make us sin. And that's the problem. You're allowed to have a big house. Enjoy. Rabbi Yudah Nasi, Rabbi Kadosh, had a giant mansion. Horses and people working for him and so on. But at the end of his life, he looked at Shemaim and they wrote the Nigma, which means it's real. He looked at Shemaim and says, Hashem, you know I didn't enjoy any of the money you gave me, even to the amount of my pinky. Yeah, but you had a big house. You had uh, hundreds of horses. You had servants. You had everything was for Hashem. Everything had a purpose to serve Hashem. The house was to host guests, Tamid Chachamim, you know, lectures, Shurim, all types of things. It wasn't just because I wanted to show, hey, look at my house, look at my house. Go, oh, yeah, and now we just finished remodeling the kitchen. Next week we're going to do remodel the living room. Yeah, we just built this kitchen last week, but, uh, you know, uh, we don't like it, so we're going to destroy it and do a new one. I went to a house one time of this uh, rich people and uh religious religious and house Bo Hashem very very nice house and uh I saw there's some ladders and so on and there were some other guests and the people asked oh so what's happening he goes oh no we're remodeling the house looked like it was mamas like it was brand new just came out of a box yeah we just redid we just redid the kitchen and the living room last year but I don't like it so we're just going to destroy all of it and we're going to rebuild. This is Bal Tashchit. This is a sin from the Torah. And this is something that's strictly prohibited. This is craziness. So having a nice house, enjoy your house. So long as it's not causing you to sin. If the people around you are all okay, enjoy your money. If the people around you are struggling where they don't have money to eat for Shabbat, they don't have money for Pesach, you have no right to go buy a $25,000 carpet. And that's the problem. Now, when people first cut their expenses because they didn't listen to Hashem, they uh, start getting distant from Him. Sometimes it's because they made a lot of money, so they're more distant because they think that they made the money. It's not Hashem gave them the money. Or sometimes Hashem is actually trying to wake them up and He's starting to take away some of the money. So what happens? They stop giving the tithe. They stop giving the masel. So here the Mishnah, the first part says, if some people, if some people give masel, give the tithe, and others don't. Meaning, we're not so bad, but some people are giving masel and some people don't. Is that, is that bad? So bad that he says, the measure for measure, punishment from Shemaim is, that this will cause a lack of rain, where some people will be hungry and some people will be satisfied. Meaning this will create a class warfare. 
You'll have rich and you'll have poor. Nothing in the middle. Now, the Midrash Shmuel says, what does it mean when it says Gufe Avira? This, you know, this, uh, this big sin that Rashi says this is a uh, giant sin, it's not uh, just, uh, you know, it's a little sin that you made a mistake. What does it mean? The Midrash Shmuel says Gufe Avira means that when people make these sins, they're creating Gufim. What Gufim? They're creating bodies. What bodies? They're creating demons. They're creating the bodies of evil angels that are coming into being and are going to prosecute them and are going to punish them. And he actually says this is simply for ignoring Hashem's will, not even going against Him. Just ignoring his will. Just not even considering him. You bought a house, you didn't even consider if it's close enough to the Beknesset. You cut your expenses, you said, okay, immediately I'm going to cut this uh, foundation, I'm going to cut this one and not the other one. Like you didn't even consider what's better for Hashem, what's not. Just ignoring his opinion. Ignoring his desire. That alone already creates these Shem and Achim demons and so on. Now the Be'er Avot says this Gufei Averot is even worse. Why is it worse? It says well, a private sin, a private sin, somebody makes a private sin. Whatever sin they made, they looked somewhere they're not allowed to look, they took something they're not allowed to take and so on. Okay, that could simply be an aberration. It could be something that uh, happened once. And he does tshuva. Chatanu avinu pashanu. Hashem didn't mean to do tshuva. It's a private sin. But this, Rabotai, these sins that are enumerated here, these seven sins, starting with the Masel, he's saying these are considered entrenched transgressions. Gufe Averot. What does it mean? It means this is something that he's become used to. Meaning this became part of his goof, part of him. He's accepted that it's allowed not to do. He's accepted it's allowed to do. Whatever it is, he's accepted it as he's changed the Allah already. In his mind, it's allowed to drive on Shabbat. Not only allowed, I'm driving to Beknesset on Shabbat. There's a few people that I remember I, uh, in the Boca Raton. And I would see them in the Beknesset, and they looked like any normal Jew. And then I would see, uh, you know, I would see them sometimes uh, in prayer if, uh, if they were at Nets, at the early Minyan, sometimes a different Minyanim. But then usually on Shabbat, if I would go to uh, Nets, I would see them. But if I go to the later Minyan, I would never see them. They would always, meaning these people always went to the early Minyan. Six o'clock in the morning, they go into the Minyan. Now one time, I come, you know, I'm going to the Beknesset when they were leaving. Because they finished, they went to the nets, and I was going to the eight o'clock minyan. And I see these people are leaving the Beknesset, and they have their tzitzit, they have everything, they just left. They went to Beknesset on Shabbat at six o'clock in the morning. I was still in my third dream. They were in Beknesset praying, Baruch Hashem, right? It's a great thing. So I'm walking, and they're walking the opposite way. I'm going to the Beknesset, they're going the other one, and in between us, there's a parking lot. And I see that I'm going and I'm saying, oh, Shabbat Shalom. And they say, oh, Shabbat Shalom. And they take a heavy left to the parking lot to go get their car and drive out. Drive on Shabbat back home. But they went to Beknesset on Shabbat at 6 o'clock in the morning. But they went driving. Why? In their mind, it's allowed. In their mind, it's mitzvah. This is a gufi avira. This is something where somebody has literally accepted the law to such an extent, accepted the, the, the sin to such an extent that it became the law. It became part of them. And unfortunately, many, many people in the United States are like this. 
They go to Beit Knesset driving and they don't have even the slightest remorse. They go to Beit Knesset on Shabbat driving, they don't have the slightest remorse. They'll pull up, pull up right in front of the Beit Knesset. They'll even say hello to the rabbi, hello to everybody, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Mevorach, on Yom Kippur, on Shabbat, on Yom Tov. It doesn't make a difference. Ah, you ask him, why are you driving? You're not allowed to drive. What do you mean? You know how far I live? Like, they look at you like there's something wrong with you. What do you mean? How do you expect me to get here if I don't drive? I live 20 minute drive from here. Don't come. Because what do you mean? How am I going to pray then? Pray at home. Move. Whatever. Do something. You can't drive. No, no, you're wrong. You must, must be something wrong with you. Did you ever read what you said? What you, no, I didn't read it. I just, the rabbi never said anything to me, so I figured it's allowed. I've been doing it for 20 years already. This, Hashem Yerachem Rabotai, is something that is very, very difficult. Because once something becomes a guf avira, something becomes a part, like Mamash, part of the person, established sin, becomes a part of his lifestyle, unless he does complete tshuva, he cannot do tshuva at all. Meaning, it's either he's going all the way to Hashem and realize that his entire life is wrong, or he's not going to do anything at all. Nothing in the middle. It's either you're going all the way, you're becoming a little Moshe Rabbeinu, a little Sarai Menu, or you're staying Yerovam. You're staying Esav. You're staying whatever you are with the belief that you are Yaakov Avinu, though. And that's the problem. That's a very, very serious problem. So now, it says, if some people give the Maser and some don't, there's going to be a very serious punishment. So what's the details of this punishment? He goes, it's going to be class warfare, where there's going to be rain in some places and, ra- and not rain in other places. So first and foremost, it says, Rashi says, this means that there's going to be an enormous amount of inflation. Inflation meaning the price rises. Everybody's feeling pressure. But the poor feel much more suffering than the rich. The... Rambam and Rabbi Yonah say that this type of selective giving where some people they give, some people don't give, God will also respond with his own sporadic giving. Meaning to some people he's going to give, to some people he's not going to give. Some of you give, some of you don't give. Hashem is some going to give, some not going to give. Midah ke neged midah, measure for measure. Some rain will fall in certain places, and none will fall in other places. And, ju- and the, the Sfat Emet says that as soon as people become tight-fisted, you know, they hold their hand, they hold their dollar to dear life, Hashem responds in kind. You're holding on to the dollar in dear life. I'm also holding to the dollar in dear life. You hold to yours, I hold to mine. Let's use who lives longer. Your dollar has to be spent at some point. Mine have unlimited. Hashem says everything is mine. Eventually you have to spend yours. But since you're tight with yours, I'm going to be tight with mine. Now, the Gemara gives us some more details of what it really means. Is Gemara in Masechet Shabbat? Is shocking, to say the least. They say the same thing as here, but with more details. As we always say, that the uh, the Mishnah is the basic. The Gemara interprets it, gives the details. It says the same thing. So, a lot of us think that certain things are simply not sins. Certain things that we can do or not do are just simply not sins at all. And the Gemara says, we have to think twice before we say such things. This is... No, this is something else. Okay, I said it. Don't want to miss
Okay. So first and foremost, the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 32a, says that Rabbi Hanin said, what is the verse that Yaakov Avinu says, Katonti mikol hachasadim umikol haemet. I've been diminished by all of the kindnesses and by all of the truth that you have done for your servant. This is in the book of Genesis, Sefer Bereshit, chapter 32, verse 11. It's a very famous verse where Yaakov Avinu, at, while he's thanking Hashem for all of the great things that he's giving him, he's also asking him for help to protect him against Esav and so on. But he says, Katonti mikola chasadim mikola emet. You know, you've already done so much for me. So the sages explain what does it actually mean. It means that even Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu knew fairly well that every single thing that you have in your life, you have to be grateful for. But at the same token, you have to actually understand that there is a judgment in Shemaim of merit versus punishment. If you're getting rewarded, it could be because you're being rewarded for something good, you're rewarded for something good, or it actually could be a punishment. The reward could be a punishment. Where do we learn this from? In Parashat Vayet Hanan. In Parashat Vayet Hanan, we talked about last week, Hashem says, Meshalem el sonav el panav la'avido. Meshalem el sonav el panav la'avido means, Hashem pays to his haters, to, to their face, to destroy them. So, to explain this, I one time said that money is like a battery. It's like a battery. A battery to do mitzvot. Battery to do mitzvot. If you use it well, Hashem recharges you, gives you more. He gave you X amount. You use it for things that are pleasing him. You give tzedakah, you do ma'asim tovim, you know, good deeds. You're, you're not wasting it on uh, prostitutes and, uh, and gambling. You're actually doing things that are good. You're a good, no problem. He's going to recharge your battery. On the other hand, if you don't, if instead of giving tzedakah and going to Bikneset, and buying holy books, and doing all the things that you're supposed to do, you're not doing good with it. Either you're holding it to yourself, or you're simply spending it on nonsense. You have two obvious options. One option you all know. What does he do? He takes it back. That's the obvious option you all know. Many people lose their money every day. That's not the chidush. What Parashat Vayet Hanan says, Meshalem lesonav el panav leavido. He pays his haters cash to their face, meaning if you do bad, he gives you more. If you do bad, he gives you a lot more. Why? To destroy you. What is that like? To overcharge the battery to the point where it des it's destroyed. Put enough voltage in that battery where it becomes dead. It dies. You can never use it again. This, Rabotai, is one of the scariest things, in my personal opinion, I've learned since I started doing tshuva. Why? Because of reality everywhere. Most people think, if I do good, I get money. If I don't do good, I lose money. They think the obvious choices. Never in their wildest dreams will they think, if I do bad, Hashem is going to give me more money. No. Not only it gives you more, it gives you a lot more to destroy you. Why? Because he knows every dollar you get is another three sins. So he's going to give you 10 more dollars, 30 more sins. Oh, 30 more sins, good. I'll give you 100 more dollars. 300 more sins. Oh, good. I'll give you 1,000 dollars. 3,000 more sins. Why? I hate you. This is a disaster. And the Rambam calls it, in Ilchot Shuvah, as the worst possible punishment in the entire Torah. Very dangerous thing to live. And if we don't pay attention, we're not going to know whether we're being rewarded or punished.
And Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu was suspecting himself. He's saying, Katonti mikola chasadim, I've already got so much from Hashem already. He protected me from Esau before. He got protected me from Lavan. He protected me so much. If he does it again, maybe it's a punishment now. What good did I do Bechlal, in this world? He's saying on himself. Yaakov Avinu, Kodesh Kodeshim, Sefer Torah, is saying, what good did I do that Hashem has even given me any good Bechlal? As we say to Hashem, Hashem, what good I didn't do. I did so much good. How come you don't give me a billion dollars a week? Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, Kodesh Kodeshim, is saying, what good did I do? Maybe he's taking away from my Olam Abba. Maybe it's a punishment. Hashem, Hashem, what am I going to do? Hashem, I need your help, but at the same time, please tell me you're punishing me. He's scared to death. Why? Because he's paying attention to the detail. He says, look, you're giving me so much more than I deserve. I have to, sec- to double-check myself. Is it because you're just so, so amazing and, and, and you love me so much? Or is it because I've made so many sins that you're actually punishing me now? We have to look at our life this way. This is Da Torah. This is the mindset of someone that learns Torah. You have to look at everything, even the things that look good. Just won the lotto, looks good, could be poison. Just got a new contract, looks good, could be poison. Just lost money, looks bad, could be a reward. Why? He's trying to save you from yourself. This is how you have to look at things. Deep. First we have to learn it, then we have to do it. We're starting with the learning. Now, the Gemara says, on page 30, this was on 32b, continues in 32b. It says some things that we don't even think are such a big deal. Honestly. We have to be honest with ourselves. Some things that we that it says over here that people do, it's almost like become like a uh, what's the big deal? Mamash, what's the big deal? What are you what are you uh, stressing out over? So first Rabbi Natan says that. How could a person, Shemirachem, suffer the disaster of losing his wife and kids? For something as simple as making a vow and not keeping it. He made a promise. Hey, yeah, yeah, I'm going to donate $1,000 for, 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 for the Bezat Hashem. I'm going to donate. This month, you'll get it. You'll get it. He doesn't do it. He forgot. He forgot. Not at all. He didn't do it on purpose. He didn't like say, oh, no, no, I'm not doing it. Forgot. Simply forgot. What? Forgot. You don't forget. You guys always remember everything. I forget. You forget. Everyone forgets. He says, for that forgetfulness, he could lose his wife, Hashem Echem. For the forgetfulness. Why? Why'd you forget? Why'd you forget? It wasn't important enough for you. If it wasn't important for you, oh, now remember something. I'll remind you of something important. And where do they get it from? This is in Proverbs 22, 27. Do not allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Shlomo Melech taught us this. So it's not like this is opinions of the Chachamim. This is all sourced from the Torah. For simply making a vow and not keeping it. You told somebody, hey, listen, uh, yeah, what do you need? You need a, uh, a partner? Okay, I'm in. And then a week later, he comes to your course, I need the money for the new the, the, the deal. Oh, no, no. I, uh, I, 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 I'm not doing it. What do you mean? But you gave me your word. I already started planning. I already started planning based on your word that you're, you're in. No, no, no. Sorry. Got to find somebody else. Oh, I find somebody else? Okay, you'll have to find somebody else too. You'll have to find a new wife. You'll have to find new kids. This is not scary. Any mother, any mother in, 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 that has a brain is right now starting to cry. Why? She has to double check everything her husband says. Don't make promises you can't keep. And if you make a promise, deliver immediately. Chas v'shalom, you'll forget. 
Chas v'shalom, you'll forget. What's the source? Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, Rabotai Yekarim, Hashem told him, Yaakov, when are you going to go back to see your father, Yitzchak? When? What do you mean? I'm uh, hiding from Esav. I'm at Lavan's place. I'm losing it. You left. Your father's house, good. You got married, good. You came back, good. But now, when you met Esav, you said hello, hello, and then you left it the same day. You went somewhere else. You didn't go directly to your father's house. For a long time, you went somewhere else. If you don't deliver on the promise to go back to your father's house, you're no different than Esav, he tells him. You're no different than Esav. Why? He makes promises all the time and doesn't keep them. Tomorrow I'm going to go to Minyan. He doesn't go. Tomorrow I'm going to do Tshuva. He doesn't do. Tomorrow I'm going to give. He doesn't give. Every day he does, he makes promises that we call empty promises. Rabbi Yehuda says, Be'avon bitul Torah, for the sin of neglecting Torah study, children can die. Instead of learning Torah, a person decides, no, you know what, I'll learn tomorrow, tonight I'm going to watch the game. Serious problem. Now, here's something that most people don't even think is a sin. Everybody knows you have to learn Torah. Everybody knows you can't just say things just because you feel like it. Everybody knows, even just common etiquette. Anyone that's a grown-up knows that you're not allowed to just promise things and not deliver. It's wrong. Everyone knows that you can't make vows and, and not keep them. It's, it's logic. You don't even need to be religious to do that. Everyone knows that Torah is the foundation of the world. If you're even semi-religious, you know that the Torah is keeping the world alive, so not studying is a very bad thing. Maybe you didn't realize that it's putting the kids at risk, but nonetheless, you knew it's bad. But here's something that most people don't think is even a sin, Bichlal. What is it? Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda had a debate. Had a debate. What's the debate? What's worse? What kills more kids? What kills more people? Making a sin and having and not having a mezuzah or making a sin and not wearing tzitzit. That's the debate. Most of us don't even think it's a sin to do either thing, either one. How many people are walking around with no tzitzit? How many people are walking or have houses they forgot to put, double check that all the mezuzot are kosher or even put a mezuzah in every single place? I have one tell me that said he did tshuva about a year ago, Baruch Hashem. And she realized I have to put mezuzah in the house. So she got one mezuzah. She didn't realize she had to do mezuzah in every door. And then one of the shiwin, we mentioned it. She goes, oh, I have to buy some mezuzot. So I got her a few mezuzot. And she put the mezuzot up. And our brother, who's clueless to begin with, what does he do? He takes them off. He takes them off the wall. He goes, nah, we don't need too much. We don't need to be too religious. What do you care? What do you care? What do you care? If I was putting a gold medallion on the wall, you say, oh, wow, it's a nice medallion. But mezuzah, no, what do I need too much? Don't be too religious. Little does he know that that mezuzah may be protecting his life. A person will tell you, yeah, but listen, the mitzvah of tzitzit, the mitzvah of tzitzit is only if you have a clothing wearing four corners. That's what the Torah says. If you have clothing, if you have a shirt that has four corners, like, which was the type of clothing that we used to wear in the days of the Gemara, you have to wear tzitzit. If I don't have a clothing of four corners, patul. I don't have to do it. I'm not obligated. There's no four corners. The Gemara in Masechet Menachot, page 25, says otherwise. He says you're right the whole year. The whole year you're right under normal circumstances. Meaning, under normal circumstances, you're only obligated to wear tzitzit if you have four corners. Unless it's, it's a decree in Shemaim. If the decree in Shemaim to punish, you're the first one that gets it. Why? You have no protection at all. It's the decree in Shemaim. 
to punish the nation. Why? They're Mechalil Shabbat. They're not giving tzedakah. They're not doing good things. They're going to strip clubs. They're killing people. They're stealing. They have uh, Ponzi schemes. All types of things. Shemaim, eventually, patience runs out. Hashem says, okay, I got to give a little earthquake there. Where? Oh, his house. Why his house? What did he do? He's going to keep Shabbat. He, uh, this, he's there. No, no, he doesn't wait to eat. Wait, but he does everything else. Doesn't make a difference. He has no protection. But he doesn't have four corners. Doesn't make a difference. First one. The level of danger for something we don't even think is a sin. And Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Uda arguing, which one's worse? Meaning, we didn't even think it was a sin. Before the shiur, we didn't think it was a sin not to have a mezuzah in every room and not, and not to wear tzitzit. We didn't even know it's a sin. They're saying, which one's worse? Why? It causes death. That's Omi Kadim. That's the depth of judgment. Continues. The Gemara says there's several things that cause death. Sinat Chinam. Sinat Chinam. We obviously know we've been suffering for this Sinat Chinam, this baseless hatred among each other. The Ashkenazi hates the Sephardi, the Sephardi hates the Ashkenazi, the Yemenite hates everyone, the, uh, this one and that one, everybody's prejudice, all those this stupid things. People are not accepted to Yeshivot because of their background or because their uh, mother wears this or wears that. All types of nonsense that we have within our nation. So we do, oh, it's a sin. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. This sin causes things to happen. What does it cause? What does it cause? betoch betosh el adam. It causes the person to have no shalom bayit. causes fights in his house. Why? He hates his neighbor. So what? He hates his neighbor. And the neighbor, yes, you have a fight with the neighbor. No, no, no. His wife hates him. Why does his wife hate him? He hates the neighbor. Why, why does his wife hate him? That's what Hashem causes. You hate your neighbor, your wife is going to hate you. Why? Why? She likes the neighbor? No, she doesn't even know who the neighbor is. But that's what happens. Why? The demon that's created from that sinat chinam affects her that way. What else does it do to Sinat Chinam? Mapelet Nefalim Ubanau Bnotav Shel Adam Metim Kshen Ktanim. It says his wife gives birth to stillborn children, and the men's sons and daughters die in their youth. Why? He hates his neighbor. He hates his neighbor. This is Gemara, Rabotei. It's not me. Not one word so far has been me. This is Gemara. You don't believe in Gemara, you have a problem. You're Kofir Gamu. You don't believe in Judaism. This is Gemara. Me, you have plenty of problems with me. It's not going to be an end. I'm sure I did a lot of things wrong. But Gemara, it's, it's, not, it's not me. This is what Gemara says. Now, it goes even more and more details. It says, what about the sin of, ma- of, of, of neglecting Maaser and Truma? Not giving Maaser, not giving Truma. What's the, what's the problem? It says exactly what this Mishnah says. The sky are, the skies are withheld from, from precipitating, dew and rain. And thus high prices, inflation becomes the norm. Meaning, everything all of a sudden is really expensive. All of a sudden to get lunch costs $30. It's lunch, it should be 2 $3 to eat lunch. Everybody needs to eat lunch. It should be cheap. It should be based on supply and demand. There's a lot of demand. There is a lot of supply. You should be, the two should match. should be fine. It shouldn't cost thirty dollars to get a burger. People don't give maaser. Inflation becomes the norm. Yeshiva, yeshiva, sh- shouldn't be more expensive than your mortgage. It shouldn't be more expensive than your mortgage to send your kids to religious school. If anything, it should pay you. In this world, to send your kid to yeshiva, is a, uh, is a you're, you're like Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? You're surrounded by goyim. You're surrounded by people who don't believe in anything. You actually chose to be a Jew and send your kids to religious school. They should reward you for it. What? People don't go to school. Why? They don't have any money. Why? It costs $1,000 a month to go to decent yeshiva. And by decent, I don't mean like the teachers are great. Rabbi Akiva, Tosfot. Eh, eh, no. I'm talking about decent, but it has four walls and air conditioner. Four walls of air conditioner, even if Amalek is a teacher, $1,000 a month. And some of these places have Amalek as a teacher. 
They do all types of strange, unusual things. Yes. So now, inflation becomes the norm as a punishment for not giving ma'asil. Next it says, profits are lost. You had X amount of money you made in your business, in your portfolio, into whatever. You don't want to give my sale? Okay, no problem. That profit that you had, the million dollars you made last year, okay, next year you're not going to have it. What do you mean? But I already planned my life as if I'm going to have it forever. Oh, good for you. You'll have debt now. Anyone that ever had any money knows how severe this punishment is. If you never had that kind of money, which means you never planned like that, you never planned for a life that's always going to be rich. You don't understand what I'm saying so far. Why? Because to say, listen, I'm used to being rich, and now all of a sudden you're poor, anyone that's ever lost money would say it was better off not to ever be rich. It was better off to never be rich than to be rich and lose it. Why? Because you've already planned your life mentally as if you're going to have it. You've already planned your life mentally and financially as if you're going to have it. The house, the car, the expenses, the luxury, the mindset, the vacations, the, 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 way, the type of clothes the kids wore, the type of shoes you wore, your expectations, your life, everything was in accordance to this lifestyle you had. Now you don't have it anymore. What are you going to do? This is why people kill themselves. This is why people kill themselves. Because their life has turned upside down. But if they learn Torah, they realize that they don't need to uh, lose their mind or lose their life. All they need to do is tshuva. The next thing is for losing, for not giving ma'asel. It says people race after their livelihood but cannot attain one. As it's stated in the book of Job, chapter 24, verse 19. <speaking in Hebrew> The dry and warm season steal the waters of the snowy season. Sheol chatau. They have sinned to the depth. So the, so the prophet Job says that the water, all the blessing we got from the winter, the rain and so on, when it became hot, the summer, it stole everything. So that, you would think, that just means the weather changed. No, 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 no. He says this is caused by sin, meaning it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's not a literal sentence. What he's saying, all the blessings we had was taken away from our, by our sins. The blessing we had, all the rain, all the extra money, all of those things, just leave it. It's okay, it's okay. Thank you. All the rain, excuse me, vote. All the rain, all the extra bank accounts, all the bitcoins, all the cars, all the watches, all of those things, gone. What happened? Made sins. What sins? You didn't give myself. You didn't give myself. What? It's not even a sin. It's not even a, you don't even have to. Uh, some of the schemes say it's, it's minag. According to them, it's not minag. According to Gemara, according to Mishnah, it's not minag. It's obligation. So, here we see the sin is, is severe. It's severe, severe. Now, So the sages continue. It says, For the sin of robbery, locusts come forth and destroy crops. For robbery. So the Gemara asks, Okay, robbery, okay, what's robbery? What's robbery? Robbery, Rabotai, they're not talking about robbery like people go into banks and they rob the bank. Robbery, they're saying it's like the women of Mechoza. What's the women of Mechoza? 
The women of the Mechoza were like cows. What does it mean they were like cows? They kept eating the money, meaning they kept spending the money, and there was never enough money for Marcel. They kept buying new dresses and going out to dinners and a new house and a new car and new this and new that. There was never money for Marcel. There was never money for the, for the yeshiva. There was never money for, for the uh, kiruv. There was never money for the, uh, you know, the, the poor people. But for their dress and for their dinners and for the house and for the jewelry and the other dress and all these things always have money. But to give hundred, two hundred, five hundred dollars for, for something that's actually for Hashem, I don't have any money. Times are tough. Nothing new under the sun, Rabotai. En chadash tachat Hashemesh. They call this in the Gemara the women of Mechoza. Who are those women? Those women, they spent, their husbands had money, but they never had money. They had money, but they never had money. Why? They had a lot of money, but the women spent everything. The women spent everything. And he calls this robbery. That's what the Gemara calls it. He calls this robbery. What's the punishment for those women of Mechoza? You really want to know? In Parashat Bechukotai, Rabotai, it says there's several levels of punishment. Several levels of punishment for not listening to Hashem. The punishment for such things, for overspending when you have when there's a gzera, there's a decree from Shemaim, Hashem Erechem, some decree comes, Gogu Magog, uh, Pogrom, Inquisition, Nazi, Shoah, all those things, Shem Erechem, when that comes, those people suffer the worst. Why? They get the punishment of a yochal al small velo saveu. He eats the left and is still not satisfied. What does it mean he eats the left and is not satisfied? Ish besal zao yochelu. He's so hungry... He gets to such level of starvation that he then eats the flesh of his own arm and eventually his own children. Why? You didn't give Maser. You bought a dress instead. You went to dinner three times a week. For simple thing, we don't even think it's a sin. We don't even think it's a sin. To be honest with you, I was reading this myself. I've gone over this Gemara before this. Still, it's every time it's a new shock. Now, sometimes you tell people these things and they're shocked. I myself, I read, I can read this a thousand times, I'll be shocked every time. But I can tell you for sure that I'm more shocked every time than I was originally. Why? Because the more you learn, the more the Torah affects your neshama. So Rabbi Israel Misalant says in O Israel, he says, sometimes you tell people certain things, you tell them genom, you tell them fire, you tell them punishment, you tell them measure for measure, they're like, ah, yeah, 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 it's good, it's good, it's interesting. What do you mean? Why are you not crying? Why are you not scared? Why are you not doing tshuva? Why are you not having nightmares? Right now, as we're speaking right now, you're like half asleep, how come you're not having a nightmare while you're half asleep? Why? Why are you okay? Rabbi Israel says, They've made so many sins that the klipa they have is like six feet thick. Meaning, you can tell them about genom and everything else, it still doesn't penetrate the neshama yet. Still doesn't penetrate the neshama yet. The neshama can only absorb so much. The more sins it has, the less it can absorb. Meaning, the more you do tshuva, the less klipa you have, the less sins, the less of a, of a uh, shell that's covering your real neshama you have, which means that the truth can hit you more. If you made a lot of sins and you haven't done tshuva for them, you can have a bulldozer come at you, it won't affect you. Why? Yeah, you're, you're, you're still in the beginning. You're still, you're still in the beginning. So this is, not a, this is not just an individual thing on one specific person, or two, or five, or ten. This is on a nation. Why? Because many people, you tell them all these things, and not only they're not scared, they don't even care. They don't even, they simply don't care. Like, oh, wow, it sounds bad. I think my rabbi said something else. I think my rabbi, I, oh, I never heard this before. I got to double check. No, I don't know. Yeah, but it says in the Gemara, I'm quoting you Gemara, I'm giving you page numbers. Go check. It's not like a commentary of a commentary. This is what it says, literally. No, I, I don't know. I don't think. I don't think it's right. I don't think. I don't think. Even if there's one percent chance for it to be right, it's a hundred percent. But even if there's one percent chance of right, that alone should give you a nightmare. 
there's one percent chance that anything I just said is right that alone should give you a nightmare if you're not getting a nightmare that means that you have to do serious chuva much more than you thought before you watched this you and the good news Rabotai is is that Hashem says listen listen this Marcel this Marcel is simply a testament to whether you believe in me that's why I take it so personally because he says here in uh, Prophet Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 if you would call a master a better a better outsar V terev BBT who be Hanuni Naba Zot Amar Adonai Tsevaot in love to have him at our bota Shemaim very cotty like him but I'll be at bleed die it says in the Prophet Malachi it says Hashem says to uh, to to the nation bring all of your tides all of your master into the storehouses Meaning, bring it to all of the yeshivot, kiruv organization, Torah, mitzvot, bring all the maser. No worries, don't think about logically, can you afford, not afford, do you have, you don't have. Bring it, bring it fast. Why? Bring it so that there may be food in my house for those who serve in the temple. Meaning, so that the people that are learning Torah are never lacking. The people that need to do tshuva always have the ability to do tshuva because there's videos made for them there's buildings built for them there's uh, whatever is done there's no there's never a lacking in Torah in the world go bring it all why test me now through this this is the only thing you're allowed to test God with Masel. only thing nothing else you're allowed to test them you're never allowed to say listen God if you're real I'll make a I don't know a, a sign of some kind now Make an earthquake. Kill this guy. Give me money. You're never allowed to test God. Never. He says here, yeah, this is the only thing you actually not only are allowed, I'm encouraging you to test me. Test me now through this, said Hashem, Master of Legions. If I will not open for you the windows of the sky and pour out blessing for you without limit. So the Gemara asks, what does it mean ad blidai? What does it mean without limit? What does Hashem mean without limit? Ad blidai says, I'll give you so much in reward that you'll say enough. Die. Die means enough. Ad blidai is like, he's telling you, if you actually test me and you pass the test, not just one time you give my say, you expect to be a billionaire next week. It could be a year. Could be 10 years, could be 20 years, could be 20 months. Who knows? Whatever the test is. Hashem says you do it. The reward for you in this world. We're not talking about Olam Abba. This world. You're going to get so much. You're going to say enough Hashem. You gave me too much already. You gave me too much already. You gave me too much. Where else does it say die? Where else in the Gemara does it say the word die enough? In the Gemara in Masechet Chaygat, page 12a, it says what happened before this world. Now, the atheists and, and, and all scientists and all those people would like to tell you about Big Bang. We all came from monkeys. Maybe they did. We didn't. We came from human beings. But they all think that the Big Bang is like a new theory or it's a new belief or it's a new anything. It's not. I said this in a lecture a long time ago, and maybe uh, you guys know or don't know, but in Gemaraim Masechet Chagiga, page 12a, it says, what was here before this world? What was here? We're not allowed to ask such questions of what's above us, what's below us, but there are certain things we are allowed to ask. Ask, what was here before this world? There were seven worlds, and so on, or six other worlds. This is the seventh world. So, okay, before that, what happened? It says, originally, there was only God. Originally, there was only God. And he had to minimize himself in order to make space for anything else he wants to create. So imagine a room is just as a room, and that's it. There's, but it's full to the capacity. There's no chairs, there's no libraries, there's nothing. Just It's full to the max, as if it's like foam. Imagine. No, you can't imagine a Meshem. I'm giving a, an, an illustration so you understand what does it mean something is full. Now, if, let's say, the whole room is full of foam, and you want to fit something in, you have to 
take out the foam. Now you can't take out God. It cannot be shared. So what? Hashem had to minimize himself in order to make room for his creation. And he created a dot. A simple point that began all of it. And then it described that this dot, which is the cosmos, started expanding and expanding and expanding until God said, Die. Enough. Stop expanding. And for that, they call him El Shaddai. That's where we get the name, the God who said die. El Shaddai means the God who said die. What's die mean? Enough. Enough expanding. This, by the way, is what the uh, scientists say that their point started with a point and expanded and so on and so forth, but they believe it's still expanding. No, no, no. It's not expanding. Why? Hashem said die. Hashem said enough. Hashem said enough. But there's nothing new under the sun. There's no new theories. There's no new nothing. But the reality is it's all in the Gemara. It's all in our Torah. It's just people don't know where to look, who, what, where, and how. It's all in our Torah. If it's of any value, if it's any good, it must be in the Torah. If it's not in the Torah, it's of no value. It's complete nonsense. So now, you, the same God, this El Shaddai, that says enough to the world, stops all of creation, enough expanding. This is where I want it. The planets are here, the moons are here, the sun is here, the trees are here, everything is here, enough expanding. Now let this world operate. He's the one that stopped it. And it says that the creation was shivering from fear, from hearing the word die, from Hashem. Fear from, it was expanding, I thought I was doing good. Oh, he said die, okay, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move, why it's Hashem? It's Hashem. I'm not going to mess with Hashem. So this same Hashem, Ishtabach Shimon La'ad, is also telling you that same die is meant for you too. It's meant for you to say, Hashem, die. What die? You tell me die. Why die? Hashem, stop giving. You gave me so much. You gave me so much money. You gave me so many houses. You gave me more than I need. I don't need anymore. Hashem, enough. Why? Because you fulfilled my mitzvah. What mitzvah? Maser. You fulfilled Maser. So here you have, Hashem is telling you, listen, on one end, I'm, I want to give you endless reward. I want to give you a lot. What do you do? You limit me from giving you. Why? Because you think that you're the one that's making it. You think that you're the one that's making this money, and for that, I have to punish you. There is no other way. I have to show you that you are not making it. And this is a very, very painful punishment. Now, it continues here and it says, if it gets worse, and not only just a few give and most don't give, but it gets to a point where people just don't give. It's become, unfortunately, like today. Where it's almost, almost, almost no one gives ma'asel. People give, but they don't give ma'asel. Even rich people, they give, but they don't give ma'asel. Baruch Hashem, if the rich people didn't give and the poor people didn't give, we wouldn't have any yeshivot, we wouldn't have any sifre Torah, we wouldn't have any books, we wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have a kiruv, we wouldn't have anything. But they're not fulfilling this mitzvah on a large scope. Why? Because we would have a lot more. We would have a lot more. Now if it gets to such a point, this Mishnah says, if all decided not to give ma'asel, not to tithe, a general famine caused by armed bands and drought ensues. Meaning the punishment goes from instead of being inflation, in, in, you know, that's affecting everyone, but also starvation affecting some people, now it gets to a point where everyone suffers, Hashem Echem. Everyone is starting to get to a point where everyone, rich or poor, they all feel like they don't have enough. The rich feel like they don't have enough, and the poor feel like they, never, they don't have enough. Meaning it's, the Rashi explains... This is actually a mental state of mind. It's not just an actuality, but it's a mental state of mind 
where people are constantly chasing their own their own wheel. They're chasing their own tail. Constantly. They're always chasing money, chasing, 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 but nobody feels like he has enough. Sounds kind of like today, doesn't it? Where do we get this from? Parashat Bechukotai, the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, verse 26. This is one of the punishments that Hashem says that a person will eat but never be satisfied, never be satiated. Now, if it continues to get worse and they get to a point where they start doing cheshbonot shamayim, they start doing, they say, no, listen, I gave Maser, it didn't work, so I stopped giving. You know, they, 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 like, you know, they gave Maser three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, and they didn't become rich, so they decided to stop. And now they decided to stop. Everybody else also decided to stop. All their friends decided to stop. All their buddies decided to stop. All the people in the Kila started. To... So it got to a point where it became a norm. No one wanted to do it. And now they're saying, listen, now things even got worse. Now even if I wanted to give Maser, I don't have the money I used to have. So now I gotta start cutting expenses. What should I cut? Oh, you know what that means? Chala? Let's just uh, let's just not do it. Don't make the whole uh, the, the, what you need for chala. Just cut off expenses. Cut off the money that we give for chala. Don't make as much. Don't do as much. You stop fulfilling the mitzvah of chala, and this gets to a point where it creates a famine. Famine meaning that it's not only a state of discomfort. It's not only a mental state of mind, it literally creates death. Death in the world. When it becomes public policy not to give chala, which is money that goes to the Levi'im, the world will suffer a devastating hunger. And no rain will fall, and rivers will dry up. This terrible punishment is described where? In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 23, Parashat Kitavo. On the verse, your heavens over your head will be like copper, and the land beneath you will be like iron. So why does, this, why does Hashem take this chala to such an extent that He considers it even worse than Maasel? It's even worse than Maasel. Meaning, Maasel, not giving Maasel is terrible. Most of us didn't even think it's a sin. Chala, for sure, we were all convinced it's not a sin. Why? Just don't make chala. Go by. If you don't make chala, then you don't have the mitzvah of chala. Chala is only when you actually are making your chala itself. You have to take a small portion of it and give it to Levim. Today, we don't have Levim, so we destroy it. We uh, burn it. So, just don't do it. Don't do the mitzvah. You won't have the avirah, right? That's the problem. He says when people's minds get to that extent where they say, you know what, I'm just not going to make it. Or better yet, I'm going to make, but not enough that I have to give the chala. They start doing cheshbonot. They start doing accounting of shamayim, of what to do, what not to do. I'll do this mitzvah, but not this one. This mitzvah, not that one. You have a serious problem. In the beginning, it was not giving maaseh. It was because you had a problem with your friend. You had a problem with the yeshiva. You didn't want to give them because you thought they already had enough money. You didn't want to give the cure of organization because you thought somebody else was going to give. It was a problem between you and men. But now with chala, this is a private sin. No one knows that you're not giving chala, except God. Meaning, now you have a problem with God. And that's a serious problem. Why? Because Adam Arishon, Adam Arishon was made for mud. Was made for mud. And Hashem, in essence, he took a little piece of him, made chava. A little piece of him, made chava. In essence, the first chala was Adam Arishon. First chala was Adam Arishon. He was the first portion of the world. Took from the ground, took from the mud, took the, mitzvah, took the uh, portion of the ground, made Adam. From him, he made chava, meaning this was a continuous thing. But only once he sinned, once he sinned, he got lowered in spirituality and he had to fix himself. How does he fix himself? God says you're going to have to, you're going to have the power to produce life, and you're going to have to work hard to produce a livelihood. Meaning that him having descendants that make the chala are fixing the original sin. You stop making chala because you're trying to save money, trying to save time, trying to save this, trying to save that. You're now going against tikkun olam. 
You're now going, you're, you're now destroying the world with something small that we don't even think of the sin before the shield. So here in Abutai, we start seeing that the world is not Efkel. We start seeing that there's, things are much, much, the Omek the depth, depth of the judgment, is much more extensive than we thought. Now, when people come to Hashem with their requests, they don't forget what they want. Usually, somebody goes to, let's say, uh, they go to a grave, Rabbi Shalom Bar Yochai, they go to uh, you know, any of the caves, any of the place, the holy places, they don't forget their their, uh, their their requests. They don't have to even write them down. Why? They just ask for everything. Give me panasa, give me more panasa, and some more panasa, and some more panasa. And the first three requests were not enough. Give me some more, and get my kids uh, good wives and good husbands, and a bigger house, and more cars, and fancy this, and bigger this, and the flash I want to feel like I was when I was 20. And everybody asks for a lot of things. They don't shortchange the requests from Hashem. Why? Because he says he's unlimited, so I'm going to ask for unlimited. He's unlimited. I'm going to ask for unlimited. No problem. But how come you're limited with him? You're asking for unlimited, but you're limited with him. Meaning that your request, your request is not fair. Your request is unfair. In the Gemara Masechet Ta'anit, page 4a, it says a few people asked heaven, asked the Shemit Barach, for unfair things. They asked for things that were unfair. One of them was this war hero named Yiftach Agiladin. Yiftach Agiladi wanted to honor Hashem and he used to have this, uh, the, the Gemara says, he used to have this little sheep I believe it's this little sheep that would welcome him every time he would come back from a war. It would welcome him, it would like run towards him like a dog. So he loved this sheep. He loved this little sheep, calf, whatever it was, animal. He loved it. But he was so happy, so happy with the result of the war and everything that happened, that he made a nedel, he made a vow that whoever welcomes me, I'm going to give to God as a sacrifice. Whoever welcomes me, I'm going to give to God as a sacrifice. He made a vow, made a nedim. This is an unfair request in Shemaim. Why? You're assuming you know who's going to welcome you. You're going to assume that the same sheep, the same calf, the same dog, the same whatever, same animal that kept welcoming you all the time, is still alive, is going to welcome you, is the only one there, that Hashem's going to make it all work, that it's only going to be... You're, in essence, you're doing something that's illogical. And for that he got punished. What happened? Who welcomed him? His daughter. His daughter welcomed him. The problem is, he made a nedel. In those days, they believed in nedelim. Even though he was a Aretz, he was a fool, this guy, he still he was scared of making a nedel and not fulfilling it. So what, I'm going to go sacrifice my daughter? What am I going to do? What's this guy saying? What am I going to go sacrifice my daughter? Rabotai, he had a serious dilemma. He had to fulfill this nedel, but at the same token, he doesn't want to kill his daughter. There's no mitzvah of killing your kids. So what do I do? Ah, there's somebody by the name of Pinchas. You guys remember Pinchas? Parashat Pinchas? There's some Gdolado. Gdolado Pinchas, Queen Gadol. Go to him, he'll, uh, he'll tell me my vow is canceled. I'll cancel my vow. I'll cancel my vow. So he sends the message to Pinchas. I need to cancel my vow. Do, do, do. Okay, come. Pinchas says, come. Come, I'll cancel the vow. This temple, this idiot, Iftach, says, why am I going to come? I'm the war hero. I'm going to go come to the rabbi. You come to me. I'm going to go come to the rabbi. I'm a war hero. You want me to come to you? Are you kidding? Who's giving you tzedakah? Who's giving you ma'asel? Who's doing all this? You come to me. Pinchas does not come to him. 
Pinchas does not come to him because of Kvod Torah. He says you cannot lower the Torah because people have no clue what's right or left. This is Pinchas. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Cohen, who saved the entire nation of Israel with his act in Parashat Balak. When Zimri and Cosby were sinning with their immodest act, he killed them and Hashem stopped the plague that was going to wipe out Hashem and Hashem, the entire nation. He saved the entire nation of Israel. Not like, uh, oh, some guy. It's Pinchas, who, the Gemara says, became Eliyahu Navi. Pinchas became Eliyahu Navi. Some say he died and he came back as Eliyahu Navi. Some say he just, Hashem just changed him into Eliyahu Navi. He never died. Either way, Pinchas is Eliyahu. Pinchas is Eliyahu Navi. So this is a big deal. Pinchas says, I'm not going to lower the Torah and lower my... It's not my honor. He's not looking for his own honor. He says the Torah, Dola Dor, does not come to some guy that's inviting him to the house because he's going to donate $500. People think because they're going to donate, you're going to come to their house. You're not allowed to do such things. It's not Torah, right? That's Logically, that's what we think, right? He's right, Pinchas. Iftah refused to come. What happened to Iftah? Iftah was punished and he died an unusual death. He killed, the, the daughter died. And Iftah himself was punished from Shemaim and he was, died in a very unusual death and he was cut into many, many pieces. And to such an extent that even his body did not get any honor even the pieces of his body had to be buried in multiple places. That's the level of punishment that he got. Why? He didn't want to go see the rabbi to cancel the vow because of an unfair request from Hashem. So now you think, oh, good, this proves that the Torah was right. This proves that, uh, that Pinchas was right, right? He didn't go. That means he was right. No. Pinchas was also punished. Pinchas Rabotai was also punished, Hashem Yerachem, where it says Hashem left him. I'm not with you anymore. He was punished. Why was he punished? Because I, Hashem was with him the whole time. It says, if I'm with you, that means that you have to learn the first thing. The first thing about me. What's the first thing? What's the number one midah that's as obvious as day about Hashem? He gives. Chazak Baruch. If I'm with you all day and all night, and you, I made you Kohen Gadol, and I give you superpowers, and you're Kodesh Kodeshim, at the very least, you should know my number one midah, which is giving. At the very least, you should emulate me. You should be like me. I give, I give, I give, I give. Who do I give to? Everyone. The Rashaim, the Tzadikim. To, who's humbler than anyone? Hashem. Because even the Rashaim that curse him, even the Rashaim that say he doesn't exist, even the Rashaim that go against them day and night, he still gives them air in their lungs. He still gives them vision. He still gives them the opportunity to do tshuva. He's humbler than all. He's so humble that he says, listen, there's no Hashem over here. They want to have a party against Hashem. I'm going to go there. Why are you going there, Hashem? They don't want you there. I'm going to go. Maybe somebody's going to ask for me. What do you... But they're having a party against Hashem. They're having a party celebrating Satan. There's some crazy people that celebrate Satan. They're having a party with Favod Azara. They're having a party worshipping idols. They don't want you, Hashem. No, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go. Why are you going, Hashem? Why? Maybe somebody's going to ask about me. If that doesn't make you cry, then you have no heart. He goes everywhere. Why? Maybe somebody's going to ask about me. Maybe, maybe somebody's going to look for me. It's 10,000 people. Maybe one. He's humbler than all of creation. He says, if you are with me all these years, Pinchas, you're with me, all the things, at the very least, you should be like me. You should be humble. Okay, you're right. He, you're, he's supposed to come to you. But 
but still when you realized he was a fool and he's not coming you should be like me and you should go to him for that I left you why giving number one thing in your connection with Hashem you don't give you have no connection to Hashem you're greedy you have no connection to Hashem you want everything for you you have no connection to Hashem you could pray until next year from here stop stop your life and pray till next year you have no connection to Hashem if you are a stingy person you are a greedy person you want everything for you you don't want to share you have no connection to Hashem why the, the basic level of understanding Hashem is knowing all he does is give no one gives him anything and that's why he says in the book of Job who gave before me now pay him back who gave before I gave who who gave before me I'm giving constantly why be like me when you don't give you have no connection to Hashem this is why the punishment is so severe you lived 70 80 90 years with no connection to Hashem what was the point so I have to wake you up. I can't let you live 70 years, 80 years with no connection to me. I got to wake you up. So I'll take your money. I'll give you too much money. I'll make you sin. I'll make you realize that your whole life is going to garbage. I'll do all types of things. People die. People this. All types of things happen in your life. You start paying attention. You realize, listen, my life sucks. You start realize, oh, my life is terrible. I got to do something about it. Oh, money is not solving it. The girl's not solving it. The guy's not solving it. Work is not solving it. The market's not solving it. My life still is terrible. What's happening? Only he could solve it. Only he can solve it. How do you start? You start realizing that you have to be like him. Have his nature. And I tell you guys that the miracles that Baruch Hashem we see don't end. They don't end. Because I see, not just my own, but I see miracles that happen in people's lives. I'll give you a few stories. A few real stories of people that are real. I'm not going to mention names, but it's not necessary. One guy, who Baruch Hashem, he... Uh, has been supporting us from day one. Always helping, always trying, always contributing. And without, I don't have to convince him, I don't have to talk to him. I don't know if I get a chance to like, talk to him, but I don't, it's, not, it's not much. It's not like a deal, listen, you give me an extra shiur, private, uh, then I'll do this, this, and this. No, no conditions. He tells me, he goes, listen, I have to tell you something. Whatever I'm giving, he's giving, he's giving his masel. It's good. I'm happy I'm giving. But I'm telling you honestly, I don't know how it's possible. It doesn't make any sense. I can't afford it. I said, what do you mean you can't afford it? He said, listen, from the time that I started, I don't know, it's been, I think, three years or something like that he's been giving. From the time that I started until now, in reality, the math doesn't make sense. I don't make that kind of money. But somehow, every time it comes to giving the myself, I always get the money to give you. That extra money that I'm supposed to give, like I'm always thinking I'm going to be short. I'm going to be short because I'm going to give, let's say he made 10000 He has to give 1000 But he has 10000 in bills. So he thinks, oh, I'm going to be short. If I give 1000 now, I'm going to be short $1,000. Right? I have 10000 in income. I have 10000 in bills. If I give $1,000 in bills, $1,000 in mass sale, then I'm going to be short $1,000 for bills. Right? He says every single time for three years straight, every single time it comes to give him a sale, your money shows up. Your money, it's like it's your money, it has nothing to do with it. It's your money shows up. I guess, and the money comes up. That's how it works. He goes, and I, don't, I can't afford it, but it comes. Why? That's how it works. He goes, and since I started giving, Baruch Hashem, Bracha, he goes, I'm never short of money. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense how I'm able to do all what I'm doing. You know, trying to contribute and so on for three years already. I thought maybe I'll do one, two, three, four times. I had a few good months. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it for a few years. Never even calculated that far. But Mamash, he started seeing blessing in his money for the first time in over 60 years. 60 years in this world, more than 60 years in this world. First time he has blessing in his money. Baruch Hashem. 
Why? Every single dollar goes to Kirov. It doesn't go to uh, pay uh, for, for, for ice cream. Another guy, before I met him, before I met him, he was just one of these people that uh, watches Shulim online. Oh, there are many people watch Shulim online. But I don't talk to all of them. I mean, some people I talk to, some people don't. Some people send me emails, requests, so on and so forth, conversations. Some people just, I don't even know they watch. I don't even know who they are. There's enough time in the world to, to, to know everybody. But anyway, one day, this person that I don't even know sends me a message. He says, it's, uh, I've been watching your lectures for a while. I don't know, however long it was, maybe a year or something like that, or six months. And... Uh, he says, it's time for me to uh, partner up. A lot of people say things like that. It's okay, yeah, Baruch Hashem. He goes, there, I want to send something. He said, oh, there's an address on the, uh, on, uh, on the website. If you want, we're trying to uh, actually, I think it was like the first CD. I think it was the first CD we were coming out with. We're trying to print a lot of CDs to give out. Baruch Hashem, we've given out, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand CDs already for free all over the world. And... It costs money. It's not free to the people getting it. It's not free to print them. So we were trying to raise money, but I'm not really good at raising money because it's just not my thing. Um, but anyway, it's a guy sends me a message at 3 o'clock in the morning. He says, oh, it's time I want to contribute. Okay, fine, contribute. Here's the address. I don't know what I'm thinking. The guy's going to send out like everyone else, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it is. A few days later, I forgot about this conversation. A few days later, Baruch Hashem, the biggest check the company has ever gotten from at that point. Huge contribution, not just for us, but also for him. I was like, who's this guy? Why is he even giving? Like, I would never talked to him, never even, nothing, no communication. It's not like we knew, we're like buddies, like the guy comes to the shurim, we talk for three hours every week. Nothing, like nothing, no nothing. Apparently motivated enough by the shurim that he wanted to mamash be a partner with it, but partner even beyond his own norm. So I send an email. I said, thank you very much. So on. Thank you very much for contributing. And then from that point on, we started talking a little bit, but never like that much. And then I started realizing, oh, he says, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've always loved Judaism. I've always studied. I've been trying to convert for 14 years. Been trying to convert for 14 years. 14 years I'm trying to convert. And every single time, I've always had a hurdle. It was the wife, it was the kid, it was the job, it was the money, it was this, it was that. Always something. For 14 years, Hashem Yachem never had permission from Shemaim to go convert. Never. And I said, oh, listen, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not so difficult. It's not about difficulty. It's just always something happening with my life. Always a problem with this. Always a problem with that. I said, listen, you know, most important thing is for you to learn. He goes, I learn already. I learn every day. I said, second thing is to do the will of Hashem. Because I'm trying. He goes, third thing is do Kirub like you just did. Okay. So he started contributing. And as, you, as Hashem would have it, apparently that was the key. Apparently that was the token. That was the code for him. 14 years waiting to convert within one year. One year of that time. A year, no, a little more than a year. 15 months. 15 months from the time that we actually started the communication and so on. Not only did he complete his conversion, Orthodox conversion, but he also completed, got married, Baruch Hashem, new house, and everything has changed drastically. Why? He did more than he's able to do. Hashem did more than he he is able to do. Sometimes Hashem wants you to see how much you wants, wants to see how much you believe in him. Simply put, he's not telling you, listen, go uh, sell your house, sell your car, sell everything, and go homeless in the street and don't eat, don't don't drink, don't do nothing. No one's saying that. 
But if you're going to start doing accounting for every single penny that, that leaves your bank when it comes to Torah, but you're not doing the same accounting for everything else, you're not doing the same accounting for the sandwiches, you're not doing the same accounting for the, uh, the fridge that you bought, the extra nice fridge with two, three, four doors, you're not doing the same accounting for the navigation system, you're not doing the same navig- you know, accounting for, for everything else that you're doing, you're only doing accounting when it comes to Hashem, that means you don't believe in Him at all. And that's a serious problem. And that's why the punishment is so severe. That's why, Rabotai, the punishment is so severe. Now, the Mishnah continues with the four other things, but we're not going to do that tonight. But I can tell you one, one major story that uh, Eliyahu Navi actually said. Eliyahu Navi in Tana Deve Eliyahu Rabba, the chapter 12, it says there were 70,000 of the tribe of Benjamin that died. They were killed, murdered. After they made a sin with a woman, a Jewish woman, they were rebuked by the people, they went to war. In the beginning, they were winning all the battles. But eventually, they were all, they were all killed. So the uh, Eliyahu Navi says, whose fault is all of this? Naturally, all of us would use our logic, just like we use our logic with, we don't have to wear tzitzit because we don't have four corners. We don't have to give maser because some people say it's a minag. Uh, we don't have to worry about the words that are coming out because it's just words, it's not action. All the things that we use our logic for. Eliyahu Navi says, whose fault is this? Our logic would tell us it's the tribe of Benjamin's uh, 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 fault. Why, they made the sin. Shem what they did to this poor woman, caused a lot of problems woman ended up dying her husband ended up killing her and so on and so forth I mean it's their fault they died they went to war they caused the problems that's who's the fault right no Eliyahu Navi says whose fault is all of this who got punished for all of this the Sanhedrin who the Gdolei Adol the 71 most righteous people of the entire generation they were at fault why when they came to Eretz Israel, they all went to their towns and they said, whoever wants judgment, come to us. You have a problem? Come to my office. You need to learn something? Come, I'll teach you. You need uh, bracha? Come. You need mezuzah? Come. You need this? Come. You need come, 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 come. Eliyahu Navi says, that's why it's their fault. Why? They were waiting for everybody else to come. They were waiting for the tribe of Benjamin to come to go learn from them. And the tribe of Benjamin never came. Because they didn't come, they didn't learn Musa. Because they didn't learn Musa, they made the sin. Because they made the sin, the woman died and everything happened. And 70,000 people died. Meaning, you have Torah, you have to travel. You have Torah, you have to travel. Why? They don't know Musa over there. They don't know Musa over there. They don't know Musa over there. And if they continue not knowing and you were able to go there, it's your fault. It's your fault. And this is not, this is against our logic. But that's why we have to learn Musar and understand our logic is useless. Our logic is useless. It's against the Torah. We have to use God's logic. We, used, we have to use the Torah's logic. The Torah's logic is straight because the Torah's logic thinks measure for measure. You want Hashem to go above and beyond the norm for you, you have to do the above and beyond the norm for you also. You want Hashem to give you, you have to give. You want Hashem to do something good for you, you have to do something good. And so on and so forth. That's how it works. It's measure for measure. Something bad's happening to your life. Don't start blaming your wife and your husband and your kids and the economy and your boss and your job and your everyone else. Blame the only person you see in the mirror. It's your fault. And it's time to do tshuva. That's the point. That's what measure and measure for measure means. Measure for measure means that anytime something happens, it's your fault. It's not the economy. It's not the boss. It's not your wife. It's not the kids. It's not anyone. It's you. And Hashem is talking to you in a very clear language. And He's telling you, my son, my daughter, it's time to do tshuva. If you have cancer, it's not because of the doctors. 
It's not because of anyone else other than you. You have to do tshuva. You have to change. You don't change, you stay the same, you're going to have the disease. And it gets worse over time. For all of those people that are so sensitive and saying, oh, it's so insensitive, that's the point. That's what the Torah is saying. Stop being sensitive and start looking at what the Torah is saying. Your sensitivity is blinding you. Your sensitivity is blinding you. Stop being blind. There's a reality here. Doesn't, you don't like it? You have a problem with God. Not with me. Me, you can have a problem with me the next week. I care less. Your problem is much bigger than me. Much bigger than I could ever be. If you have problems in your life, if you have sadness, if you have anything wrong with your life, Hashem is talking to you. He's telling you, my son, my daughter, something is lacking on your end. Fix it, I'll fix it. You fix it, and I'll fix it. That's the deal. That's the deal. You have something lacking, that's because you're lacking. It's not, your, it's not your father's fault, your mother's fault. Oh, I grew up in a irreligious house. I grew up in a too religious house. I'm tall, I'm short, I'm ugly, I'm pretty, I'm this. All that stuff is nonsense. All of that stuff is nonsense, Rabotai. That's what Hashem is trying to tell you. And that's what Rabbi Yitzhak Berdicha was telling us in the beginning of the shiur. The minute you give any power to anything other than Hashem, you've made yourself an idol. You give power to your money, you've made yourself a, an idol. You give power to the money you don't have or the money you do have, that's an idol. You give power to your looks that you have or you don't have, that's an idol. You give power to anything other than God, you have an idol. And you have a serious problem. Measure for measure works like that. The depth of judgment is much, much higher than what we can comprehend. This is why we're obligated to learn Musar and understand, at least to the best of our ability, the depth of judgment and realize how far it is from our logic. Once you realize that it's far from your logic, you start realizing that learning Torah is not something you should do. It's survival. Breathing is not something you should do. It's for survival. Eating is not something you should do. It's for survival. Learning Torah... Learning Musar, it's not something you should do. It's for survival. Once you realize and you treat it like it's survival, then you'll understand what Resh Laki said in Gemara Maseret Brachot, a person needs to learn Torah to the extent where he's willing to sacrifice his life. What does it mean, sacrifice his life? He realizes that if he doesn't learn, his life is done. Why? He's going to constantly get punished. He's going to constantly fail at everything. Why? There's no way for him to have his own judgment be right, be straight, without Torah. Because naturally, our, our mind, our thoughts, our direction is opposite of Torah. Why? Because it's influenced by the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah will always give you a different direction. Right direction is right, Yetzirah says left. Right direction is to give, Yetzirah says, no, nah, no, give, give next week. Right direction is uh, don't look, Yetzirah says, no, no, look only once. Yetzirah doesn't tell you, listen, go uh, become a Christian overnight. He just tells you in the beginning, listen, listen, just look at the girl on TV. It's not even a real girl, it's on TV, it's digital. It's digital, it's a big deal. No, look at the girl. No, Okay, so you look at the girl. The next week he comes to you and goes, okay, so you look at the girl, look at two girls. The next week he says, okay, you look at two girls, you look at uh, this, look at that, steal here, steal there. He comes to you with small little sins. By the time he's finished with you, Hashem Elohim, the Gemara says, by the time he's finished with you, you're asking him, where's the Avodah Zarah? I need to worship it. Because you started becoming acclimated to the, to, the, to the sins to such an extent that it became part of Gufo, part of your body, part of your being. You got used to it. You got used to not being generous. You got used to being stingy. You got used to being mean. You got used to being angry. You got used to doing all these things that are against Hashem. And that's a serious problem to have. So, Bezat Hashem, this will give us a little bit of an opportunity to do some self-reflection over these next few weeks before Pesach. Because just like we have the mitzvah of getting rid of our chametz on the outside, you know, all of the uh, unle you know, unleavened bread, all of the, uh, all the things that we're not allowed to eat, 
if you're Ashkenazi, then you're not allowed to eat uh, uh, rice, even though technically it's not chametz, but it's based on a minag that's already 400 years old, that's considered kitniot. If you're not Ashkenazi, if you're Sephardi, uh, then you are allowed to eat uh, 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 rice uh, and kitniot, unless you're Moroccan. So each person needs to know the basics of their own halachot and also their own minagim. So you have a couple of weeks to do that. You, uh, it's not so difficult. It's not impossible. Besides Hashem, we're going to do some shiurim in, in, uh, in New York, but most of the stuff we're going to talk about is the Musar aspect of it. Each shiur is going to be different. It's not going to be the same shiur each time. Besides Hashem, Hashem will give us different words each time. Uh, last but not least, the, um, uh, this shiur, Tuesday shiur, we're going to take a break from for a little while until I come back from California, which is about a month from now. Uh, a little over a month, uh, but we will have one shiur uh, in Florida before the uh, long trip, which is probably going to be uh, the Hollywood shiur on Sunday. Not this Sunday, the following Sunday. That'll be the last shiur in Florida for a little while. So definitely try not to miss it. Either way, online is always available, but there's never uh, it's never as good as uh, in person. 